but I'm just saying, howdy to all you replay viewers. I'm so glad you're here. Um, <laughs> I know there's a topic for this this uh, live. I have to go get it though because I forgot what it is. <laughs> Let's have a look. If you're here, just say hi because I cannot see from. Lulu, yay, now it's working. And boundaries and clarity. Ah, how not to be a dictator or a pushover. Yeah. <laughs> hi, Anthony. Hi, sweet David. <laughs> so today I thought I'd like. Hi Gary. Hi Krishna Doll. Krishna non no, non. Ha! I think I said it right, but I don't really know. Hi Amaka. Yay! I don't think I'm saying your name either, but right. But let me know. Amaka Amaka. I think. I mean that's how I say it in my head, but I don't know if it's true. <laughs> um. I thought it was really interesting to. Um, I probably should have titled this How Not to Be a Victim of Your Child, because <laughs> that's really what we're going to talk about. Hi, Stephanie. Um, how not to live out this narrative, this this narrative from a parenting perspective. And this is uh, going to make lots of things clear, whether you've ever been a parent, never will be a parent, but if you've, if you've ever been a child. So um, how to not be a victim of your child, because this is what causes... 95% of issues in the parent-child relationship is when we, hi Carolyn, when we start to have a belief structure system narrative in our mind that we are in any way, shape, or form a victim of our children, right? Like the ter there's certain like terminology and narratives that we use like terrible twos or we have a lot of like eye-rolling, um, exasperating expressions for like teenagers. Um, uh, temper tantrums. We have all these words in this narratives that actually put us in a victim role of like, uh, which disempowers us. And then all you have is two children, right? You have two children that are trying to have a relationship and a conversation. There's no adult in the relationship. There's just this, um, and it creates cognitive dissonance. It creates an inability to connect to each other because you're the victim, um, of your child. And I don't mean this mean or bad or wrong. It's just one of the narratives that's happening. So like I had a woman come to me with a two and a half, three year old. And they're like, she's, ru she's running my life. Um, she's hitting me. She's aggressive. She's, um, not going to bed. She's not eating what, what it, we're giving her. And, you know, and, and the narrative, the narrative was, uh, my, I'm a victim of my child. My child is running my life very close to my child is ruining my life. You know, it's, she's out of control. <laughs> I'm having, ah, I don't know what's going on, but I, th my internet looks okay. It is true. Um, and, um, when you come from that place of like, that I'm a victim of my child, you're not in a place of clarity. You're in a place of trigger and reactions. So you're being triggered by something inside. You're either being triggered by the behavior, you think it's not right, you think it's not okay, you think it says something about you, uh, you don't want to be the way that your parents were, um, all kinds of narratives. Hi, Michael, that will make up, or Michelle, I think it's Michelle, um, who, all this narrative that we make up in our minds about, um, hi, Ellie, being a victim of the child. And <clears throat> this starts in parenting, and it will continue on for the rest of your relationships if this is what's happening watch later it's jumping and pausing can't wait to hear it how not oh angela i don't know what's happening so I, I, facebook seems to be having some interesting um issues with live i've noticed not just in this live but like in lives that i've watched last week that it's doing something strange very very strange maybe we should do it in a group hey marcus mm -hmm. um i've had this very conversation with my wife i've actually told her that she has to be the adult in the conversation Okay, that's awesome. Now, let's talk about what an adult is because I think we have very skewed ideas about this. But let me finish the story first about this two and a half year old, three year old. And so I was like, it's very simple. You have no boundaries. 
that's all that's happening with the two, the two and a half to three year old. Um, you cannot set boundaries with words. It's not possible. Like they don't under, they're cognitively, they cannot, they don't understand. You can yell at them. They will understand that you're yelling and you're not happy, but they won't actually understand that they shouldn't fight or they shouldn't whatever, right? These are, they're not, um, co so a, a child, a small child needs like, um, tactile communication and needs to know that you're really clearly present with them. And so we put into um, place a couple of behavioral tweaks for the mom. How do I deal with when she's throwing a tantrum? What do I do when she's not eating? What, where do I, where, what are my boundaries? What do I need to set in place so that I feel calm and collected and not triggered? And for everybody, it's different. There are, there's like a, a blanket too, but for her, it was like she made these little tweaks and she wrote me 24 hours later and she's like, I have a completely different child. I said, no, 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 no. You just have a completely different you. Like your behavior has shifted and kids pick up so fast. They just, they shift. She's not a completely different child. She's just now, you're clear. Before you were, you weren't clear at all. And she's just going to go willy nilly. Just willy nilly. People, are, adults do this to each other, by the way. If you don't have clear boundaries, if you're not clear about where you stand and you're not coming from like a triggered position, um, the people around you will be willy nilly. They'll be out of out of sorts around you. And with kids, you see this really fast. You do a couple behavioral tweaks for you. People come to me like, I want to fix my kid. It's okay, Lo, let's find out what's going on. There's nothing to fix. If we just do a couple behavioral tweaks, we create some boundaries. And boundaries, I don't mean punishment, or it's a boundary about me. Like one of my boundaries as a parent is, let me see. Like there's certain ways I don't like to be treated and I'm really clear about that. Right? There's no consequences. I'm just really clear I won't be treated this way as a human being. I'm a human being and this is not how I'm going to be treated. With uh, small children, it's really about clarity. It's With any child, with any human being, how clear can I be so that I'm calm in myself? That's what a boundary does. It creates calmness in me. So I'm not like in this chaotic, panicked, reactionary place with my child or with my partner or with whoever. Hi, Lily. Hi, Katie. Hi, Orly. Hi, Sophie. Um, so let's now, now we move into like, what is an adult? Because there's a, you be the adult in the conversation, but here's the truth. If you grew up and there were cognitive glitches, I call them cognitive glitches where, uh, you have been, um, hurt. So in this case, you have a 15 year old, is that what you said? Hold on a second. With our teenager. Okay. So whatever the age of your child is, it is a guaranteed factual experience that you will be experiencing yourself as well at the same age. So your most of your triggers and the way that you're communicating with the child, whether they're two years old or they're 15, is going to be also, not only are you in the room as the adult, but your 15 year old is standing in the room. And if your 15 year old has unresolved cognitive development, you now have an opportunity while your child is that old to raise yourself. You cannot be the adult in the conversation if you have not done this piece. Because otherwise, you're going to be in a reactionary state. Your 15-year-old is going to be in a reactionary state with your, with your child who's 15. So you have to raise your own. It, having children allows you to cognitively rewire and repattern yourself in moments that you didn't have that ability to do it because of many different reasons. It could be trauma. It could be decisions. It could be neglect. It could be abandonment. It could be all kinds of emotional triggers that you have and you couldn't cognitively de develop past that 15 year old trigger. So when your 15 year old is there, your 15 year old trigger appears. So you have to raise yourself. You have to understand, oh, that my 15 year old is being triggered right now. And I need to pay attention to that for a second before I ever enter into a conversation with my child who's now 15. And no matter how old your kid is, whether they're two or they're 15, you're not the victim of your child. You're not. You can't be. A child cannot be running and ruining your life. No. What's running and ruining your life is you haven't set clear boundaries for yourself. For yourself. You can't actually not set a boundary for a kid. Kids set their own boundaries. Every human being is a sovereign entity. They create their own boundaries. Um, you can only ever set a boundary for yourself and be really, really clear about it. And people in my life, they respect my boundaries. When they don't respect my boundaries, um, 
my boundary. I listen. I respect my boundary. That's it. Nobody else can. I, I respect my boundary. And when it comes to kids, the more clearly we are respectful of our boundaries and theirs. This is really important, especially if you have teenagers. It's important no matter how old, but the teenager age is where it starts to rub because that's where most of our, um, that's where a lot of our pain comes from. So, um, and where our cognition was, was uh, glitched the most normally is in the teenage, the transition, what I call the make or break years, 12 to 15, 16 years old. These are the make or break. These are the years that you have an opportunity to have the deepest, most profoundly connected relationship to your child than at any other time in their lives. It's an opportunity. Most people don't take it because they don't recognize it. It's an opportunity. It's also an opportunity for you to grow beyond anything you can even imagine. For you to actually grow into that place where you're not fighting with your teenager. That doesn't need to be happening. You can have disagreements. You cannot be okay with certain things. But fighting with your teenager means that you feel like you need to fight with your teenager who is simply cognitively not where you are. And it's very few parents that don't expect their teenagers to think the way they do. A 15 year old does not have the same cognition as a 25 year old. And if we're talking about uh, cognitive development, uh, males don't finish cognitive, like where the brain comes back into balance and hormones balance out more or less. For men, it's um, 25. For girl, women, it's a little bit earlier. And there's a lot of cognitive stuff that gets messed up in that phase from like before they're 23 where um, they learn that, they, that they're a burden to their parents, that they, that they can... Uh, act certain ways and their parents react certain ways. They learn they learn the victim bully paradigm from their parents. And that's just, that's not the case. You are equal human beings with your child. Whether they're 2, 15, 17, you're an equal human being with them. You're both sovereign. Um, and the, people usually go two directions. If you become a victim, then you think that you are, you become like a pushover. Or you become a dictator. And either way, you become disconnected from your child. You're not connected. You you, um, you go separate ways. There's a lot of attitude. Usually, this is what I hear from parents. Oh, they just they have such an attitude. And when that's the case, I always ask, well, what's where's where are you in the attitude spectrum? Are you having an attitude? Because you can't come at your children, whatever age they are, in incongruency. If you're not congruent, so if you're telling them not to have an attitude while giving them an attitude, that's not, they, they're going to call your bluff every single time. Every single time. They're going to see, they're going to see through the facade. Right? But like for me, when my kids have an attitude and I'm like, hey, what's going on? I know I'm not having an attitude with them. Right? I know where I am. I know that I'm not a victim of my kids. I know that my boundaries are clear and set and uh, also fluid. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of like some examples of very recently, I want to keep it as recent as possible about um, one of my clear boundaries as a mom is no lying. So how did I come to that boundary? Why is it so important to me? And how do I like put it into a place that makes sense to me and the whole like culture of my family? So there was a time a long time ago when my oldest was eight or nine and he started like stealing our money and lying and uh, doing some weird things. And we tried all kinds of things. We bullied him. We uh, manipulated him. We bribed him. We yelled at him. <laughs> we did all kinds of things that didn't work. And we sat down and I was like, hold on a second. I need to figure this out from my perspective. Bullying, manipulating, controlling, dictating to a child is an indication that you're in reaction that you're not clear, that you don't, that you have not set clear boundaries for yourself. So I was like, what environment am I creating that causes my nine-year-old to feel like he needs to steal money and he needs to lie? Like, what is not happening? Like, what's not, where's, where am I incongruent here? And so I remember when we decided, I said, look, I don't want to create an environment where lying and stealing are required you know, as normal behavior patterns. And by punishing him, I was, cre I was helping to create those patterns. 
oh, now, now not only do I get in trouble for lying, but now I need to hide that I'm lying because I don't want to get in trouble. So um, I created a boundary for myself. Everyone in this house is allowed to lie. I don't like it. I don't want it to happen. So I'm going to create the space that if you've lied and you need to come and tell the truth, there are zero consequences from my side. Now, there was once that my son was um, riding the bus black, we call it here, so he wasn't paying for the ticket. And he came and he told us, he said, hey, the last couple of months I've been taking the bus and I haven't been paying. And it opened up a conversation. We're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And hi, Katerina. And um, wow, that's really interesting. Um, how do you feel about that? And he said, well, I don't know. And we talked about how, like, the consequence here in Switzerland, if you get caught um, riding black, is a $100 fine. Or is it $80 and then it goes up, right? And so we, we were really clear about this is what's going to happen. So if you get caught, you're going to have to pay the consequences. And it's going to be a lot more, probably a lot more expensive than just buying the ticket or asking us for money to <laughs> buy, buy the bus ticket. And, um, thank you. And... Then my husband said, you know, Noah, I, I think it would be a really cool idea if you went and you put that $80 into the machine to give the money back. I think you'll feel better about yourself. Because there was this thing where he wasn't feeling really, he, he didn't feel like it was right, right? And that's why he brought it into the conversation. And so it, there was no consequence. We didn't do anything. He did go and pay the money to the machine, which is like nobody knows that he stole, but he, that made it right inside himself, Right? And he also was like, but, and then after that, like after he did that, he came and he said, well, you know, I think I'm okay with every once in a while, like riding the bus black and knowing that there may be a consequence if I get caught, um, but I'm not going to do it like regularly anymore, you know, but like, just if like, I don't have the money and I catch the bus or whatever, like I'm okay. Like now I'm okay with like, if that's the case, you know, I break the rules and I'm willing to take the consequence of that. So there's no, when I created that boundary my boundary was my my boundary before that I thought it was my unclear boundary was there's no lying and that's bad and you're a shitty person if you lie but what I found was I don't like it when people lie to me it hurts me I don't like it and I don't want to be that place I want to be the place where people can come and tell me everything I want people to be safe with me and especially my kids and so my boundary became it's okay everybody can lie and if you come clean I hate that word it's kind of weird like you've done something terrible I think the only reason we lie is because we're afraid then there's no consequences. But it has opened up so many conversations between me and my kids. And there was even one time very recently where my 17-year-old was trying to get out of something. And he, it was like a little white lie. And I'm like, you just lied to me. He's like, yes, I did. <laughs> and we're like, I'm like, okay. And that's it. It's just like, that's it. There's no more conversation. We both knew. He knew, I knew. And we just went on. And it's like, you know, I... I, it'd be cool if you don't have to lie to me, but like I catch it in that moment. I'm like, you just lied. He's like, yes, I did. And that was it. There doesn't need to be a consequence or a, a repercussion or whatever. The consequence was he felt how weird it felt between us. I felt how weird it felt between us. Like, that's not what I want between us. That's not our relationship. That's not how we relate. And um, I don't need to clear a boundary than that. When uh, with smaller children, I had boundaries of like no hitting. Eh, these are fun ones. But the thing is, with a two-year-old who bites consistently, like let's say a two-year-old bites and bites and bites, and you've tried everything, whatever that means, um, biting back is a vi viable option. And I don't mean biting back like to hurt or to harm. I mean biting back to show them, hey, this hurts, right? But not like there can be no emotion behind it. There can be no anger. There can be no um, aggravation. There can be no frustration, no irritation, none of it. Um, but a, a child before language responds best to physical feedback. And so that doesn't mean abuse people. Don't go there. That's not what I'm talking about. But, but being able to set a boundary of this isn't okay for me. Whenever you say to a child, we don't do that. Or this is unacceptable. There's no clarity there. That's not a boundary. That's, uh, it's kind of manipulation. It's, it's a bullying tactic. The better way to do it is like, I don't like it when you bite, but I actually did this. Oh, you just bit him. What do we do now? What do we do? What do we do about that? And allow the solution to come up between all the people involved, me and the kid who got bit and the kid who, who bit. What do we do now? Like, it's a fact. You bit. Now what do we do? Um, 
<laughs> I have a neighbor girl. She's now, this is like two years ago. She like, uh, she came up and I, I bent down and I said, oh, hey, and she's just spit like full on, just spit in my face. And I was like, holy shit. Right? <laughs> like My default, my upbringing would have been like um, being really offended, yelling, angry, whatever. But instead what I did was I grabbed her face and I licked her entire face from like one side to the next. I just licked her face. Uh, little girlfriend, she never spit in my face again. I don't think she ever spit at me again. She had like a big phase of like spitting on people. And I don't care if she spits on other people. That's not my business. I don't want her spitting on me. So I am able to address it. And that was a clear boundary. Like, hey, you spit on me, I'm going to lick your face off. <laughs> so there's ways to do this that, that can be like really humorous and really easygoing. And it doesn't have to be like anger. It doesn't have to be aggressive. It doesn't have to be, um, right? It can just be like, that's a no for me. <laughs> If you're going to do that, I'd recommend letting know and a discussion person ask for Stacy. That you can do later on when they're little, when they're like two years old and they're before they're cognitively languaging, talking to them does nothing. Have you ever been um, out and seen a parent talking to like a three-year-old like, I told you not to do this and you know why you're getting in trouble and the kids just kind of like, they don't understand words. They don't understand. They understand the aggression. They understand the anger. They understand the emotion behind it, but they don't actually understand what they did wrong. And they're not learning anything. They're not. They're just learning to be careful about what they don't know. It teaches hypervigilance. So, um, for example, another one, uh, at the swimming pool, um, we see here in Switzerland, it's a little bit different. There's not the, the, uh, suing culture that there is in the States. So there's a lot more freedom and a lot more parental responsibility required, um, nurtured, asked for participation. So, um, yeah, you could talk to a two-year-old without blame, shame, and guilt, but don't expect them to fully understand you. That's, that's, that's not doing anybody a service. It's, um, I'm trying to think of like, oh, so this is, this is one of those where, um, it can feel, feel, it can sound really harsh, but it was a, a level of clarity that I only had to use once. So, um, it, we're at the pool and there's no, you know, my kid, I had four kids. I got kids running everywhere and I'm at a pool and there's that, that panic. So there's a certain age where each of my children would like literally walk to the side of the pool on the stairs and want to go in. And I watch parents like pull their kids back and put them in floaties and do all the things. And, Yes, do those things. I'm not saying don't do those things. But I was at a point where what if they didn't have floaties and I had to turn and grab this kid and they walked off? How do I be clear with my children that they don't walk in the water? And so I was very observant and I did this with all four of my kids. Um, when they were at that age where they were like going to go walk in there and they weren't afraid of the water and they weren't afraid of the depth, I walked behind them as they walked and they went in the water and they went bloop, 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 bloop. And, and they looked up every time. And I waved and I wait a second for them to, there's a, a look that they get where they realize, uh, I can't get out of here. I can't, I can't, I'm stuck. And I just reach in and take them out. And then I sit by the pool and I'm like, are you okay? Uh huh. We don't want to do that again. Uh uh. Right. And I only ever, I did this once with each kid and that boundary was set and clear. It was an experiential experience for them to realize, damn, that's not a good idea. <laughs> and and I, because they weren't cognitively able to understand, no, don't go in the water. Ah, ha, ha. No, don't go in the water. Eee! They think it's a game. You know, like, that's funny. You're scared. <laughs> that's funny. You're scared. Let me do this a hundred times. And then mommy's having a heart attack, you know, forever. And it was so, it, this was a boundary that I was just like, this is a clear boundary. It was in absolute safety. I was 100% with them. And usually when I did that, my husband was there. I'm like, okay, look, they're going, I'm going. And, and able to bring this space of experiential learning to like a really clear place where their life depended on it. And it worked really well for me. So and again, I'm not recommending that you do this, but I'm just giving options of what's possible. Hi, Adelina. Yay. So 
with a two-year-old, with a two-year-old, you're going to need more tactile. So when you're talking to a two-year-old, you want to be touching them. This hap this is good with um, most kids up until about twelve. You want to be like touching their arm or um, at their eye level, but not like in anger and not like you're going to listen to me and not like you know not with that energy of that, but just like hey, um, you have my full attention. Let's figure this out. Right, and if a if a two year old's having a tantrum, for example, you don't really have to do anything. Like the best thing you can do is just sit next to him and be like, "Cool, dude," and just wait for it to be done. Just wait. It will be over faster than you think. So just wait. I'm gonna chill here. I'm gonna ch I'm gonna chill here next to your tantrum. I'm gonna sit down. Maybe I'm gonna read a book. <laughs> Maybe I'm just gonna squat next to you and look <laughs> and watch and observe. But I'm going to be where I'm at inside of me, calm, relaxed. I am not a victim of my child. There's nothing wrong with them because they're having a tantrum. It's okay they feel all pissed off or upset about whatever they didn't get or that they needed. And it's okay. I don't want to give it to them. I don't have to. And I don't have to fix the tantrum. I can just be present to them. For an example, you're talking about who bit my mom when I was two. She bit me back in a non-aggressive way. True, I never bit her again or anyone else, but I'd never do it myself as a parent. I'm even though our littles don't understand vague lots of words. Yeah, and it depends, right? That's the thing. It's like a non-aggressive approach to like biting or hitting um, just gives them the feedback that like, oh, that's that's not that was that was the because they're just gonna try everything, right? No child who bites, no child who bites, and no child who hits, and no child who kicks, and no child who has a tantrum is evil. Or trying to upset you. Super important. They're not trying to manipulate you. They're not trying to ruin your life. They're not trying to mess up your day. They're not. They're just experiencing life. And sometimes they need feedback. And that's what you give them, feedback. It's not and the, what we'll call boundaries in a parenting scenario. But it's not... Um, they're... Often, too many times I hear parents feeling like, my kids are trying to ruin my life. You know, I don't have time for the tantrum. Like, there, I, I wrote yesterday and something else, I wrote, there's no calendar for the amount of presence a human being needs. You can't schedule that shit. You can't have a date night with your kid once a week for an hour and think that that's the only presence that they need from you. You can't do that in any relationship and think that it's going to thrive or survive. So... Setting really clear boundaries as a parent means being really present, really, really present, not only to your child, but first and foremost to yourself. Am I triggered right now? Oh, this is mine. I just spoke to a client uh, prior to this call about feeling really awkward when her 14-year-old wants to hug her. She's like, I didn't get hugged as a kid, and I don't know what to do, and I feel really uncomfortable, so I don't want to do it. And I said, well, be uncomfortable. Be uncomfortable. That discomfort is, is the gateway to your freedom. Allow your child to hug you because that discomfort that you're feeling isn't her. It's not hers. That discomfort that you're feeling are all the, the narrative, the old default narrative that you grew up with. That's what feels uncomfortable, not the affection with your 14-year-old. The affection with your 14-year-old is the key to your freedom. The affection with your 14-year-old is the key to your healing. So let her hug you and feel uncomfortable and unmoved. And faster than you know, hugging your 14-year-old is going to be the most natural thing that ever happened. You are not the victim of your child. You never can be, no matter what. And that narrative needs to shift. That narrative from children are a burden, children are ruining my life, they're really difficult, it's really hard. That needs to shift within you. And the only reason you have that narrative is because you lived that narrative as a child. You were given that narrative as a child. And then that narrative creates glitches in your cognitive development, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. And you carry that glitch into your own parenting. The really cool thing about parenting is you can pick up the pieces of your glitches and raise yourself into the adult. If you're ever feeling a victim of your child, it's because you're meeting your child with your own child. You're meeting your teenager with your teenager. You're going head to toe with your 15-year-old. Your 15-year-old is meeting your 15-year-old. 
your adult self is not. Your adult self um, is most often in the background kind of mortified at the situation, frustrated, overwhelmed, confused, going, what the hell is going on here? Right? Because the trigger has triggered you into being a 15-year-old with your 15-year-old. Uh, another way that we don't set clear boundaries is we lead our, we allow our fear to lead our parenting or to lead the relationship if you're not a parent. I'm afraid that they're going to have sex too young. I'm afraid that they're going to do drugs. I'm afraid that they're going to get hit by a car. I'm afraid that they're not going to be the person I think they should be. I'm afraid. And from that fear, we create the, we create the relationship to our children through that massive gookie layer of fear. And if we're afraid, we can't set clear boundaries. We will set strong, strict, controlling, domineering, um, dictator-like boundaries. Prisons, mostly. I wouldn't even call them boundaries. To try to protect them from this behavior, and by setting those really strict, push-away, separation boundaries, you're actually pushing them towards the exact behavior you're terrified of. You're pushing them away. So they have to go get affection external to the house, external from you. They need to get it from their friends. They need to get it from drugs. They need to get it from the wrong people. They need to hang out with these bad people. They need to, they, they need to go get that affection and understanding outside of you because you've created such, you didn't create boundaries. You created prisons and walls that didn't allow you to connect with your child. So they have to seek affection that somewhere that isn't you. So letting fear lead your parenting, letting fear lead the relationship, uh, it just sucks. It's not efficient. It's okay. And nobody does it on purpose. It's all by default. Nobody wants to create that kind of relationship with their kid. Nobody. Because it's, it's done by default. And also talking to this client today, I was like, okay, so there's your default. The default is I grew up, my dad left when I was eight. My, not mine, this is like them. My mother, I was a burden to my home. After my dad left, it was too much and too hard. So I had to have my own back. So that's the old narrative. I said, yes, that's true. That's never going to change. And your new narrative is, this is my childhood. This is how I grew up. It's true. And I can do better. I don't have to do better, but I can do better. So I'm going to shift my narrative. Hi, Lisa. From, I can't do this. I don't know how. I didn't have enough affection in my childhood. My parents fucked me up. That's the old narrative. To, how lucky am I that I get the opportunity to be close to my child? How lucky am I that I get the opportunity that my child wants to be affectionate with me? How lucky am I that I get the opportunity to grow up for real through being a parent? The parent that I needed first for myself. And when I became when I become the parent for myself that I needed, I'm the exact parent my kid needs. That's how it works. So when I'm struggling with my 12-year-old, because at 12, this is what happened to me, I need to look at my own triggers and be like, oh, that's mine. Not splat it onto them. And if I splat it onto them, it's okay. I'm not gonna blame shame and guilt myself to kingdom come because that doesn't work. That just perpetuates the old default patterns. Patterns can own old patterns, bad patterns, dysfunctional patterns, ugly patterns, patterns that don't serve us anymore can only be held in place with blame, shame, and guilt. You can't walk out of a pattern so long as you're holding, there's guilt or shame or blame around it or guilt. You can't blame, shame, and guilt. You can't. You have to be able to look at a pattern and go, oh God, that sucks. That hurts. That's ooh. Okay. All right. That's what I did. That's who I was. And I can do better. And how cool is it? I have an opportunity now to do better. I have an opportunity to pick up some of my pieces. I have an opportunity to be a different parent than I than how I was parented. I have an opportunity to be with a child or a partner. Like, let's say that you went through a divorce and all the shit that happened in that divorce. There's an old narrative now. But that old narrative doesn't have to be the new narrative. And it definitely doesn't have to be what you have in the future. So it can be, yes. These patterns happened, they sucked, and I can do different, I can do better. And not I can do better because I'm doing shitty. Not I can do different because it was horrible, but I can do different because I know different now. 
I want different. I want to be connected to these people, to my kids, to this person. So I can do better because I want to do better. Simple. Really, really, really simple. I can do better because I want to do better. Not because I need to do better because I'm bad. Right? Mm -mm. I just want, I want to do better. I don't want my children to grow up insecure in themselves. I want my children to grow up as they are actually, you know, independent, sovereign beings who uh, we live communally together. And what do I mean by that? Um, and all the things that we do in the house and all the things that we create, we and all the, the boundaries that we create, it's always about we're community. We're living as six human beings and a cat in a house and everybody matters, everybody counts, and everybody needs the help. It's really that easy. That simple. My kids don't have chores. They just do the things that need to be done, like the things that need to be helpful. That's it. When I ask, when I say to Quinn, hey, could you pick up those books for me because I need to vacuum? He gets that, oh, I got to put the books away so that mom can vacuum. That's a part of me being a part of the community. That's my, that's how I can help. He gets that. <clears throat> what is it? Boundaries and clarity. The other thing that can happen if you're afraid for your kids is that you don't set boundaries at all. And what happens when you don't set boundaries, when you're not clear? You know that attitude I was talking about? Hi, Jennifer. Uh, if you're not clear, and there's a couple things you need to be clear, especially when they're teenagers, I'll tell you in just a second. If you're not clear, you're going to start experiencing resentment separation attitude from your teenager. They will start to push you away. They will resent you. And that's very painful. But just know that that's a sign that you're not being clear. And what are you not being clear about? I love you. I see you. I respect you. And I've got your back. Those four things. You have to be clear. All kids need to know this, no matter what their age are, but when, when we move into the teenage years, super important that a child knows this beyond a shadow of a doubt. I love you, I see you, I respect you, and I have your back. I have your back. When shit goes wrong in life, or something happens at school, or at your job, or with a friend, or with a girlfriend, or whatever, that is shit that happens out there. But with me, I'm going to have your back no matter what. Hi, Jensen. We all do our part when I have done everything for till now. Going from zero boundaries to clear ones. Oh, that's a good question. And it's important. Oh, my God. It's important. It's important for you. You're going to, like, dry all up and shrivel up like a prune. <laughs> I feel very passionately about this. So I just be honest with my child. I go to him and say, hey, look, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. I can't. I don't want to do this stuff anymore by myself and um you're big enough in your body like you know when you were three maybe you couldn't vacuum <laughs> you know when you were three maybe I didn't want to teach you how to do the dishes but now with your body being where it is and your um understanding and a level of responsibility is, is growing in a 12 year old it's growing that like oh I can be responsible for certain things in my life I have girlfriends who like their kids do their own laundry my kids can do anything that a household requires except the laundry. It's like the final frontier. I haven't, I haven't taught them how to do laundry yet. I'm folding it, yes. They can all fold their own laundry. But like doing using the actual machines, <laughs> I haven't taught them yet. So where I would go with it would be to be really honest. That like I'm sick and tired of doing it by myself and I need help. Like I need help. And um, there are certain things like, like I said, so like the laundry... Um, that's my job kind of exclusively. Uh, but like, for instance, and I, I told them like this too, like take out the trash. See, if you take out the trash, then I can do the dishes. If you do the dishes, then I can take out the trash. If you take out the trash, I don't have to take out the trash. That's fucking awesome. And then I have a lot of gratitude for them when they take out the trash. I'm like, dang, they took out the trash. It means I don't have to take out the trash. Like that's awesome. 
And when I say thank you, I mean it from that place of being totally in the awesome, because how cool is it that I didn't have to take out the trash? Right? Like, I celebrate that stuff. Um, uh, I have certain standards of cleanliness that come from a certain way that I was raised that I've had to slowly over time let go of. Um, and so what did what I did was while like teaching them to clean the bathrooms, uh, the toilets, the sink, the bathroom, the the you know the rim around the 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 shower, the bath, or whatever. Um, I just slowly moved them into like, hey, come here, look, and I would show them what wasn't done right. Not like, hey, look, you did it wrong. I said, I just like I would just show them and slowly. Uh, introduce them to those kinds of things to my standards i slowly introduced them to my standards i didn't like barf it on them um i would just be really clear like i i need help because i this it, carrying this all myself is too much anymore and that's really true for me like i don't want to be the one who's doing everything in the house no i don't want that i don't want that i live with six other people um and for me for us we always talk about it's in symbiosis you know, it's in, um, we're in community. We live in community. Whether you're a two-person family or a ten-person family, we have to work together. And when we don't allow each other to work, it's like you're also giving them an opportunity to give back to you and to give back to the whole communal family unit. To make cookies, we went to the store and bought cookie chocolate chips. Ooh. Should have showered again. Made the dough and then told me that she was inviting her friends over after school and was going to get more cookies. Yay up the living room so she did I was too tired I was right yes how cool is that like my kids also like and here's the other thing the kids do not have to like taking out the trash or doing the laundry or, or, or whatever I mean I can't tell you how many times I've been fucking pissed that I got a sweep or vacuum or pissed off that I got to clean the toilet like I feel that so I understand when they feel that I understand when they're like god again I just did it like I get it I get it that it's not fun <laughs> They don't have to have a smile on their face when they do it. Don't force them to have that. Like, let them feel, like, pissed off about it. Watch with your eyeballs. Because what I watch is, like, oh, they're cleaning it. They're 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 complaining and they're they're mad about it. But, oh, they're cleaning it. So I just keep my mouth shut and I'm thankful. Yes, scary. Thank you. It is. And this is, thank you. I started asking him to keep his room clean, but he doesn't. Okay, that's another place where, that's where I have different boundaries. So I'll tell you in just a second. I don't want to stand over him while he cleans his room. Okay, good. So, yes, I just experienced this today. Hi, Allison. No one likes it, but it's something we need to do. Exactly. So here's, um, pick the things that you really give a shit about in the house. Like, for me, I don't care about their rooms. They have to live in it. Now, what I do care about is, like, no food. Because that's it starts to smell stanky in your room. And if that stanky comes out of their room, and that affects my living space. So <laughs> there's my boundary. Just no like living like food, like no yogurt containers or cereal bowls or um, whatever, anything that's food related. It doesn't really have to do with ants, it's just yucky. <laughs> Hi, Yara. So, um, but as far as like my 17 year old's room is, his clothes are everywhere. I can't even go in there and I don't even know what laundry is. So I do laundry on Saturdays and he um Saturday to Sunday and I just say hey I need your laundry and he has his own laundry basket which is never full until that day and he goes through his clothes and puts it all in there and um so it's it's about okay Carolyn here's where again he won't even he won't even right there's this idea that like oh it's so hard he won't even well it's about you being clear like hey this and you might have to be clear 50 times I'm not even kidding you might have to say look and like I come up with, I come up with like really kind of cool shit. Like, <laughs> um, we're going to talk about entitlement in a second. That's a really, I don't know why that just came up with that, but I want to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. I've ta I'm not so not there. There's an incongruency. So he's going to, of course, not listen to you. This is guys, this is normal. This is so normal. If you're doing something and you're telling your kid not to do it, it's not congruent. Stop it. Get over it. Right? It just happened. <laughs> right? And um, so my kids, and it's interesting. Like, I leave their rooms, and I would say they probably clean them every six weeks. And, um, or they come around when their bed sheets are nasty. And I'm like, okay, yay. I don't, I, like, sometimes I'll be like, no, I want to clean the bed sheets. 
but usually it's just they bring it when they've had enough of whatever grossness it is and this is how they learn too what their limits are what their boundaries are what they're willing to live in and live around um my 15 year old daughter is a bit i don't think she's much different but um there's just places like i don't care about their rooms i just i don't and every once in a while their dad's like you get in that room and you clean it it's disgusting and they do <laughs> and they do used to throw out the dishes rather than risk getting in any trouble. Right, so, um, entitlement. How have we dealt? Because I think every child at some point, depending on the, goes through this thing of like, you should give me everything. Like you, or the, the argument, well, you decided to have me, right? Um, so you should like take care of my every worldly need for the rest of my life kind of <laughs> attitude, right? And all of my kids, that's not true because I have four. So Noah, the, the lesson that was learned through Noah, my other kids learned as well because they watched it unfold. But Noah, when he was about 12, um, started being really kind of snippy and wanting money all the time and saying that he wasn't getting enough and that his friends do you allow the kids to only help with what they want around the house? The answer is no, yes, no. Sort of, kind of, no. How do I explain that? They do what they can. And that means that my 15 or 17 year old, my 12 year old can do more than the eight year old. That doesn't mean he doesn't, he's got shit that he can, you know, they do what they can. What What's, um, my 12 year old can vacuum the whole house. Like she's got a big enough body. Her body works that way and she can vacuum the house. Um, cleaning the windows, like they can all do all of it. But they usually like, when we clean the whole house, like as like we, okay, now it's time to clean the whole house. I'm not talking about daily stuff that needs to be done. Then we choose. It's always like on a, on a revolving roster kind of thing. Like this time this person does that. The next time that person does that. If somebody really doesn't want to do a job, then we, I mean, we're six people. We figure it out, right? Um, but the daily things that are, they're just daily things. It's so, it's way easier to be like, this is what you do. This is what you do. This is what you do. And this is what me, this is what I do. This is what daddy does. Right. We include ourselves in that. That's congruency. That's congruency. And the kids see, oh, my kids are doing this. My parents are doing this. It's just clear that I would step in and take, do my part. So it's not, oops. No, oh, my husband's going to be very late. Okay. Let me just turn this off because it's going to make lots of noise. Don't do it. Um. Oh, <laughs> he sent a crying face. I love that man. Um. So, <sighs> sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you guys for waiting. Um. So there's like a yes and a no about what they want. There's certain things that they just need to be done. Like every, Casper and I cook every night. Um, and the younger two clear off the table, put the food in the Tupperware. They also set the table. They set the table. Um, they This is like the everyday stuff. Uh, let's see. Everyday stuff is when the trash is full, Ayla takes it out. When the compost is full, Roland takes it out. Um, the, the lower half of the dishwasher, Roland puts away. The upper half, Quinn puts away. At night, Quinn and Ron set the table for dinner. Then Casper and I do the cooking. If the kids and if the kids do the cooking, which they some, they're getting more and more doing that, then it gets reversed. So, Casper, when Casper and I do the cooking, then the older two, my teenagers, they and Noah works every day and comes home with Casper every day, and has that. Like there was a point where he was like, you know, I don't think I should have to do that because I work. And we were both like, we work every day and we still do all this. Like, what makes you think you're so special? <laughs> Like, uh, nope, <laughs> we're in this together, remember? Like, if we're, it's a sinking ship. And so, like, we, we bring the, we, we all matter in the running of this household. So then the teenagers, they do the actual dishes, like cleaning them, doing whatever doesn't go in the dishwasher. And the two littles, they, they, um, take the stuff off the table, put whatever's in the Tupperware, um, clean off the table and the surfaces. Um, if the kids cook, then Casper and I do the dishes and the cleaning up. Um, that's like the everyday stuff, kind of. And nobody loves it, but it's just, it's just what we do.
come and say, you know what I want? And it goes on. Yeah, but here's the, here's the thing about kids always want everything. So this, this maybe lines up with the entitlement thing that I was trying to talk about. So he came and he was like, um, just being really rude, like really rude about us not giving him enough of everything. And so my tactic in that was I started making a list. I made a list of like, um, that for one month, like the clothes that we bought him, his haircuts, um, his portion of the groceries. Um, I made like this list. I wanted to like show him he's 12. Remember, I'm thinking he's cognitively able and capable of understanding ideas. But at 12, his hormones have kicked in and his emotions are wonky whack. So, um, and I, I'm giving him this list and I'm like, I just want, and he's complaining every day about, you know, not everybody else gets this and that and all these blah, blah, blah. And, and it was just getting to the point. And there was, I can't, I don't remember the point, but there was a breaking point for my husband. I don't remember what Noah said, but I know he said something kind of nasty to me because I was trying to explain, hey, I want you to see what you do get from us, what you are receiving from us. I want you to understand. I was trying to be like, oh, and I, I don't remember what Noah said to me, but it was something where Cass was like, that's it. Hi, Marlena. I'll read this. So Casper's like, okay, that's it, Noah. You're done. I am not giving you allowance. We have an allowance that the kids get. No matter what, it's not tied to anything. He's like, I'm not giving you allowance. I'm not um, providing anything other than food and shelter for you. That's it. It's done. And I was like, what? Wait, we didn't talk about this. <laughs> so here's another thing. My husband and I parent completely different, and that's the way it is. We're completely different. You know, I don't argue. I don't argue. I just sat there for a second. Okay, that was okay. That was and my marriage and my mind was well and as well as well. I had to get this and get and I had to pay for my own stuff. Like I had to pay for my own clothes. I had to pay for my own graduation dress. I had to pay for everything. And so I'm having like this panic attack because I'm having this huge trigger of my own and oh my god, my poor baby and blah. And I'm just sitting there, letting my trigger calm, and I'm just waiting. I'm like, okay. And Casper goes off, and Noah's sitting there, and he's pale. Like, the, the blood has drained from his face, and he's like, the fuck? It's hitting him. He's having an opportunity to feel what it means to have this behavior, to be a turd. And we all take, I don't know, there was a break. Or there was a break. I remember the day, and I remember how big he was, but I don't remember the actual conversation. Um, and Casper came back. He said, okay, here's the deal, Noah. I'm not ever going to pay for like another piece of your clothing, uh, for another haircut, for anything that you want. But I am going to offer you the opportunity to make your own money. And my husband has a landscape gardening business with 25 employees. And he gave Noah the opportunity to, in the vacations, he was 11 and a half. So in the vacations that we have, at a minimum of one week, if he wanted to, he could do two weeks of like coming and shoveling and doing like the shit work, you know, like breaking down the branches and just the repetitive work. And um, he made way more money than he ever would from us with allowance, but it also t it taught him work ethic. It taught him cooperation. It taught him all kinds of things that I could never have imagined could happen. And he was, and that's where like the entitlement just for him, he under, he understood at that point how, what work means, like what it takes to earn an hour's worth of, of income, what it, what goes into creating the income that supports him right now. Ayla had a bit softer entitlement issue, a little bit softer. She was like, well, I don't think I should have to help in the house. Same age ish, 11, 12. I don't think I should have to help. I don't think it's fair. I'm just one person. I don't think I should have to clean up, you know, the kitchen after everybody else. I don't think I should have to do the bathroom after everybody used it. I just, no, that was her thing. And so, and my husband deals with these. He's so good at this. I love him. Um, but he's like, okay, Ayla, I see your point. I see your point in, in your argument. And so let's do it like this. I will give you your portion of the household budget. So your portion of like groceries and all the things, the household budget that belongs, you know, if we take our stuff and we divide it by six, you will buy your own plate, your own fork, your own utensils, your own cup. You will buy your own groceries. You will buy your own um, laundry detergent. You will buy your own everything. And we'll detach from you completely. Like you're just singular person moving around in this house. Uh, you can live here, but then you're now responsible for all of your needs. I'll give you the money. But if you don't want to help, then then you got to take care of you. 
But she had the same look that Noah had on her face. <laughs> like, you know, she had to weigh, is it worth it, right? Is this, these are the kinds of clear boundaries that we set with the kids that are not mean or nasty. It allows the child to grow in themselves and be like, okay, do I want to be a turd and fight for my independence and my sovereignty at 11 and a half? Or do I want to do the dishes and get all my meals made for me? Because I like it. And get my laundry done and folded. And, you know, and, like, be taken care of. Like, let me think about that for a second. So with each child, it's different. Now, Rowan is now 12, and she hasn't gone through this phase. She may never, because she was able to witness and experience. And we've talked a lot about these things. Like, over and over, we've talked about these stories, right? Because it's just fun. And the kids are like, dang, I was a turd. Like, they're amazing in how they see themselves. Pay for herself of herself, but Bill was. I love that. Entitlement is the covering over of the actual wound that is not enough and feeling not enough. The polarity of the behavior trait that protects the wound. Yes and no. Yes and no. I think that that my children didn't have the wound of I am not enough. My children were be, were experiencing and experimenting with arrogance. This was a completely different thing than when you're an adult or a teenager. Like a teenager will be entitled if you don't set clear boundaries. When I talked about resentment, they'll start to demand and be entitled because they don't feel enough because they don't, they're not sure that you love them, that you see them, that you respect them, and that you got their back. Those things have to be in place. You have got to provide the space for them to feel that and know that beyond a shadow of a doubt because you show up, you're congruent, and you really do have their back. And you do everything that is necessary for them to know that you have their back. You don't abandon them. You don't um, mistreat them. You don't, you don't withhold affection when you are there for them. But like at, at this age, this was more, this was more a practicing, practicing arrogance. It wasn't about them not feeling enough. That wasn't what was going on. Then you got annoyed at how poorly some people do their jobs. My kids too. Or they get, they get mad, like, um, they do different. So for example, uh, Noah and Rowan, so they're the first and the third child. Um, they are incredibly quick. They're like, they work at like a pace like me. They have the same kind of energy. Really like, um, they, they get in and they get out and they get the job done and they do a really good job. And it's like really good job. Um, Rowan and Quinn are much slower, much slower. And they do a really good job, but their pace is different. And the way that they do it, like the, they, it doesn't seem logical to me when I watch them. I'm like, you're making it way harder. But they still do it. It's just their pace and how they do it and their choice of strategy to do it is completely different and allowing space for all of that. And it, it only, it bumps up when we're doing like a, what I, like when we're cleaning the house and uh, whoever's cleaning the kitchen or the bathrooms isn't done and the person who needs to clean the floor is getting agitated because they're taking forever. But those things happen. But that's another opportunity. It's an opportunity to have patience. It's an opportunity to talk to each other. It's an opportunity to say, hey, this is really bugging me. Like, I want to change this. How can we find a way for this to work for all of us? That kind of thing. Arrogance. Yeah, and we all have, it's like, it's like the little kid who's biting. He's, he's testing shit out. He has no idea that biting is going to be a, a bad idea. <laughs> right? And so when, when they're, when they're going through their emotional mass, where they're learning how to, I'm going to, I'm going to put this on and see what it feels like. That's where they need us to give really clear boundaries. Like, okay, all right. Like you can play at that, but let's see what, what the consequence of that would be in real life. If you're going to go out of the house and you're going to be arrogant like this at a job, you're not going to have that job for very long. You're not going to have a relationship with somebody for very long if you're like that. So I want to give them real life skills. I want to give them real life feedback of, whoa, what's that feel like? If I choose to be an arrogant jerk, because that's all they're doing. They're just trying on arrogance. Experience is a lot with my boy. He has been influenced by his dad and childhood, but he grew up past. Yeah, and they all just trust, trust too, that they're going to grow out of all their phases. Just that they do it. They get better and they get older. Yeah. And the, the knowing that your child is going to come out okay is really important. Really important as a parent because we worry, right? We worry like we worry about the stupidest shit. And we worry about um, viable, valid shit. Um, but if I parent my kid through worry, I'm going to be a tyrant or I'm going to be um, a carpet that they can walk on. Right? They need to know. 
they need to know that you have their back. They need to know that you're going to show up when it's really important. And how do they know that? Is that you show up when it's not important. So there's certain family rituals that you can put into place, family cultural things that you can put into place uh, to make sure that they know that you're a touch point. And that is you talk about everything openly, honestly, transparently, and congruently. And um, for us, there are certain spaces where like there's just nothing but our time together. So we have dinner at the table every single night. And some nights that's eight o'clock because everybody's doing shit. I got four kids, two of them play basketball. I have a husband who works till seven. But like right now it's eight. He's not going to be home for another hour or at six. He's not going to be home for another hour. Um, whatever that is, we have Sunday morning brunch uh, and Sunday night dinner is a big deal. We do a big deal with that. But we have these things where, and in that time we're cooking together. We're sitting together. We're every single night we're eating dinner and we're not just eating dinner and everybody gets up and goes and does their thing. We eat dinner and we talk and we connect and um, we talk about everything. Everything's on the table. When there's a crisis, when somebody has a crisis in my house, everybody, it's like, it's like uh, people can be at all different parts of the house, upstairs, downstairs, in their room, doors closed. Somebody has a crisis, like an emotional, something happens and it's like everybody comes out and is with that person and present. And it's really phenomenal. It's, it's, it blows my mind. Like the phones get put down, the iPad gets put down, whatever the hell is being done gets put down and everybody comes and is present because that's a culture. It's something that we have cultivated. We're a community and when somebody is down, we all are there for them. And that's how, that's how somebody knows you have their back. Oh, I have to be at this meeting, but you just came home crying from school. Fuck the meeting. Or let me call and tell them I'm going to be late. I have your back. I have your back. I have your back. And I can only have my kids back because I have my back. Because I don't bully or manipulate or control or blame, shame, or guilt myself. Even when I mess the fuck up. And I mess the fuck up all the time. Uh, yep, bedroom space. Thank you, Yara. What if the son won't talk to me? Won't go to the park, movies, beach, won't talk at home, watch TV, or leave in the same room. Okay, so this is just a symptom. And again, I had a conversation with a client who was like, um, uh, at what point do I talk about the sexuality? Said, you, you talk about sexual sex all the time. Like you, it's on the table. Kids are, but they're uncomfortable and it's awkward. Yes, it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. You keep talking about it so they know they have a safe place to talk about it. So that when they want to and finally have curiosity to talk about it, they know that they can come to you. So what's happened here is just a symptom of he doesn't want to talk to you. It's uncomfortable. It hurts. And you just stop talking to him because it seems easier. Right? I remember um, we didn't have a family culture either. My mom would be like, oh, come shopping with me. Come grocery shopping with me. I'm like, I don't want to go grocery shopping with you. Because the touch points weren't there. Right? The, the, um, I didn't want to go. I was 14. I didn't want to go shopping. I didn't want to be with my mom. I don't want to spend time with her. Like, because there was no regular daily uh, connection. So it was hard to, like, want the connection when it wasn't that on a daily basis. So, the way back, and you can always go back, is to just start talking to him. Start inviting him to sit with you. And don't stop. Don't stop. No matter what. Don't stop saying, I'm here if you want to talk. I love you. Can we talk about this? I miss you. Could you sit next to me? Would it be cool if we went to the movies together? Um, uh, the other day is a really good example. My son's 17. He has a lot of... He's in an apprenticeship. So... On Mondays, he's in school all day long, and then third, uh, Tuesday through Friday, he works. Um, but he has a lot. He has to learn something like 5,000 plants, like their botanical name, their Latin name, where they grow, how they grow, when do you cut it, the whole year, blah, blah, blah. He has a lot of, of stuff that he has to do, and so he was sitting down to study. And we decided to drive to Germany about an hour away to this kind of famous place that has all different kinds of cakes and torts and just really cool shit to eat and uh we were all getting ready to go, and I'm like, "Are you? You're not? He wasn't making it up to come. He's like, "I'm not coming. I don't want to come." And I'm like, "Oh man, I would love for you to go." You know. And then Casper came too. He's like, "Yeah, I'd love for you to come too. Why don't you just bring your homework in the car?" And 
it's ah, 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 and yeah, you know that that energy. And we're like, come on! And we're all excited. We're trying to. I'm like, there's gonna be food, and you're gonna be able to eat. You know, I'm like, I'm playing with him, and he stands up and he pushes the chair and he grabs his homework. He's all, okay, I'm coming, but I'm only coming because I've been forced to. And my my husband walks up to him and he has to look up to him now. He says, "Honey, no, don't come if that's the reason. It's okay. You don't have to come." And my son could take a deep breath. It's like, okay, I'm coming. Right? It's not up to you. It's not up to the child to initiate conversation. It's not up to the child to initiate um, the relationship. It's the full responsibility of the parent. Full responsibility. The relationship does not sit on the child's shoulders ever, not ever, not ever. I guess, but less frequently because react rejection hurts. Exactly. So this is your trigger. And if you can get in there, heal that, feel that, love the fuck out of yourself, it's okay to be rejected. So I'll give you an example. Am I available to keep letting you know? Yes. So that the, the, the fear of rejection, your kid can't reject you. Like, I just, I want you to be clear on this. You are not a victim of his rejection. Your parents rejected you. That's the pain. So your 12-year-old, who was rejected from affection and love and care and didn't know that her parents had her back, that's the one you need to embrace. That's the one you need to be with. I had a daughter, I have two kids, who when you push, they close. And like, it takes forever. It's like, open, open, let me in. Like it takes forever for them to come out. So I had to learn to be with these children um, in their the way that they are. I'm not trying to force them to be the way that I am. And I talk about all the fucking things all the time. I can't shut the fuck up, right? And I have two kids that are just like, like if there's a push, right? So it's, it's, um, I, it was, feel, I felt rejected. I felt left out. I felt like, let me in. If you don't let me in, I'm not going to know what's going on. And oh my God, right? To just being with them and being like, okay, when, whenever you're, you want to, I'll be over there. And then I would keep checking in. And with my one daughter, we had like a big fight or something. And we never had to talk about it afterwards. But I did the touch point. I came in and said, hey, Eric, hey, that sucked. She's like, yep. I'm like, I love you. She's like, I love you too. I'm like, we good? We good. <laughs> you know, have a little cuddle on her bed and that's it. That's all that's necessary. So um, they can't reject you. You reject you and then you reject them. Your child will never, they'll say no, like, no, I don't want you to kiss me on the lips. No, I don't want you to be close to me. No, don't hold my hand. Or like, for instance, with my son, I'm really, really, he's 17, right? And we're at, walking up to the restaurant and I put my hand through his arm and he went like this. And I thought, oh, do you want me to not, do you want me to leave you alone? And he's like, no, no, I'm just adjusting my arms, right? Because I don't want to, gl I don't want to glob. I want to give him the space that if he wants to be that guy, then let him be that guy. Like, if he doesn't want his mom touching him, you know? Um, but, and so I'm really, I'm really sensitive, but I'm not being rejected by my child. You, you can't be rejected by him. When you think you're rejected, then you don't approach him anymore. And that's where the break is. It's a make or break age right now. 12 to 16 year old is the make or break time. And they will push you away and they will test your boundaries. Are you really here for me? Do you really care about me? Are you really congruent? Like, are you sure? That's their job. That's what they do. It's just, it's just a part of what it is. They're going to test you. They're going to. They're going to not believe you, and it's just your job to keep being congruent. Keep being there. Keep not letting their rejection affect you. Like, yes, acknowledge, I feel rejected, it hurts. Acknowledge your pain, acknowledge your emotions, but acknowledge really clearly that it's not coming from your child. So important. Because I have a feel, I don't know what's going on with him. I start to panic that he's not okay. Yes, exactly, and he is okay. And that, but that panic causes you to not talk to him. That panic causes you to like pull away, to withdraw. He feels that. Let them feel annoyed with you. I'd rather my kid be annoyed that I'm like all up in their business and loving the shit out of them than like I don't care about them. Because that, that's what the ultimate message will be. The ultimate message, if you continue to, like, if, if, like every time you try and he's like, no, and you just give up and you don't keep coming back, the ultimate message belief system that will develop is that you don't care. Um, yeah. Hi, Perry! Okay, 
Okay, this is, um, this, so the, I don't know how to do it because I'm backwards on here, but so this is a, it's called Ecamm, E-C-A-M-M -M for Mac. And then it's like literally two clicks because I'm tech kind of challenged. And it's literally two clicks and you get your stuff in there and it's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. And it's easy. It's just, um, you, and then you, I don't know. It's super easy. There's like three things I had to do when it was all set up. And I think it's like 39 bucks for life. And every couple months I get like, uh, updates. <sighs> yeah. So that panic is, and I, the other thing for you, Caroline, is to every day give yourself credit. For how far you have come this is so important as a parent so important to give yourself credit like instead of being like i suck and i need to do better and we do need to do better like i'm i'm with you on that but not but not without this i suck part we do need to do better than our parents did but not, not without the i suck part you know like like give yourself like the fact that you care the fact that this conversation even interests you is big and i want you to give yourself credit for that it's so important as a parent to like acknowledge yourself because it's not up to our kids to acknowledge us it's not up to our kids to validate us that is not how this relationship with our children works they it is not their job it is not their responsibility to carry that so we need to validate ourselves and we need to maybe have friends or partners that we can go to who can help validate for us it's not the responsibility there's too many times i see as a child carrying the responsibility, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, I'm glad I thought I would die, and I still miss him. Yeah, I, mean, I can't even imagine that's coming for me faster than I want to think. He surprised me last week and showed up on Friday. He had taken the day off for Kelly's birthday, so that's so weird. Yeah, he's grown into a man. Like I often, I joke, but it's not really a joke. I truly have, like, a desire to, like, buy an entire street, and we live on a street. So everybody has like their private separate little homes, but everybody lives on the same street. I love it. I would love it. My kids are like, you're crazy. <laughs> I would love it. That would be awesome. <laughs> you're welcome, Kayla. I just want to say that arrogance is covering over the hurt. If you were congruent, not a polarity, there wouldn't be a behavior trying to overpower others or love. Yes. And so what did my husband do? We got congruent, right? That's why I would agree with you. And it's not... You have to remember that a child, this is where we try to adultify children, and we can't, we have to stop doing that. Okay, so we will try to, like, psychoanalyze our 8-year-old or our 9-year-old or 11-year-old, when really what they're doing is just very natural, developmental, cognitively necessary behaviors. Right? Having a concurrent parent is awesome. But what I would say, Allison, to that is this, we cannot apply adult psycho and analytical um, stuff to children. We can't. That is a big mistake. The behavior of arrogance, the behavior of entitlement, the behavior that they're showing is a necessary cognitive development that they have to go through and that has been suppressed. Like, I was not allowed for one single fucking second to be entitled. I did not have the freedom. That was a fuck no. That was a scary fucking... The even thought of it, like, creates fear in my body now, right? My kids have the freedom to have that cognitive necessary learning experience. It's necessary for them to go through that developmental stage. But it's not, and it's not always covering up the hurt. Not always. Nope. Not in a child. And it, we do that. We apply adult principles, adult psychology to children, and their psychology is completely different than ours. Completely different. It needs to be. Um, it needs to be protected, it needs to be honored, it needs to be respected, and it, as not adult. This is why we have the most problems in the parenting narrative, the most problems in child psychology. They do not have the same um, psychology that we do as adults. Yes, being the love or lack of polarity for them is providing. I don't know what you mean by lack of polarity. Um... And sovereignty, I'm 100% on board with that. And I also, with children, believe that their sovereignty needs to be held, right? It needs to be um, cultivated and nourished by the parents. Not just like you're sovereign and go do whatever you want, you know, when they're three or whatever. That doesn't work. There's no, there's no feeling of being held. And children need to feel like they're held. 
even if um, the boundaries feel like they're squishing, they, they would prefer that to no boundaries, to no clarity, to a parent who's not congruent. They would rather have a very congruent parent than a parent that is all willy nilly because they don't feel safe. They need, that's our job to create that sense of safety, safety of like, I got your back. I'm not going to abandon you. Even when you're being a turd, arrogant, entitled, having a breakdown, whatever, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. And a lot of that times that means we have to learn how not to abandon ourselves. All the time. I'm not even going to say that. That's all the time. Not to abandon ourselves in those moments where we feel uncomfortable. Right? Like with the rejection. <gasps> Whoa, fuck, I feel rejected. I feel like my kid doesn't like hanging out with me. This hurts. And I'm going to be with myself. I'm not going to, I'm not going to distract. I'm not going to look for a way to get out of this. I'm just going to be present to myself. I'm not going to jump in that anymore. Polarity is your polar opposite of the feeling, covering over of the vulnerability of the need, allowing the full moment to keep. Yes. Yes. And my kids absolutely, absolutely feel vulnerable. Like they know they're safe to be vulnerable. Like I do too, to be vulnerable with my kid. Like that's a culture that we've cultivated in this house. And, um, my kids can only be vulnerable with me because I'm vulnerable with them. It doesn't, we, you cannot ask another human being to share their whole vulnerable selves with you if you're not sharing it with them, child or otherwise. They're, it's incongruent. You tell me everything, but I'm going to keep secrets from you. It doesn't work. And I don't mean secrets, like, um, but like, for example, let's talk about the, the, talking to children about sex. Age appropriate, whatever you decide is age appropriate. Trust the, trust yourself and trust that you know your kid the best. But there's, you have to be talking about it. We have to be talking about these things. And so how do I talk about sex with my kids? I talk about my own personal experience. That includes, I was raped when I was 12. Um, I don't talk about that with, uh, I mean, I talk about it at the table with my teenagers, but my other kids are, are around, but I don't talk about like the, the logistics of it until they're about 15 because they can't understand, right? Or I talk about how I had sex for the first time when I was 15 and I wasn't ready and it was confusing. And so I don't tell my kids don't have sex. They are not having sex, either one of them right now um, or ever that I know that, and I know that to be true. I want to say, oh, you know, but there's always, no, I know that to be true. So, but I tell them what it was like for me to have sex too soon and what it was like for me to have as many sexual partners as I have or what it was like when I met their dad and how different that was. And um, that it's not about morals. It's about being connected to yourself. Cognitively, sexual development, if a person is given from the age, from when they begin to self-pleasure, whatever age that is, it can be really young, uh, until at the minimum of 18, without partners, their sexuality is, is whole and complete before they ever get into a sexual relationship. If self-pleasuring has been shamed, uh, guilted, wronged in the household, that's, that makes a break, a glitch in their cognitive development because every single time that they self-pleasure, they're feeling bad about it. But if they've had the, the space to be with themselves, to self-pleasure, to learn about their bodies uh, completely without any other feedback from another human being, by the time that they're 18, their, their sexuality is intact. And they will make very different choices in the in their sexuality uh for the rest of their lives so super important to just keep talking to them about it talk about the things you're afraid about talk about the things that that didn't go well for you talk about the things that go well for you talk about how beautiful it is this, and the, you could read take out the word sex and any topic be honest be transparent don't hide if you did drugs talk about it if you smoke cigarettes talk about it if you um did shit like my husband did a lot of crazy shit when he was a kid talk about it tell them talk about it don't just tell them not to do shit tell them what you did and tell them the consequences and tell them what, how you feel about it and tell you like share your experiences with them because then they're going to see you as a human they're going to see you as a safe spot they're not going to see you as an authority or somebody to be afraid of but like wow there's a person here like my parent isn't just a parent there's a human being here that cares about me enough to trust me with all of themselves. <clears throat> I have a few minutes. Anybody have any questions? I'm literally bothering you.
Oh, I wanted to ask you guys stuff too. That's right. Okay. I don't know. I might make just a post. Um, Cause as some of you will know, I'm writing a book or the book is writing me. I don't really get it. And from that book, We'll be doing online courses and it's on parenting and in the style of this live <laughs> talking about all of those things that things like this that i'm talking about and i really would love to know like what topic is like a burning not a, not where you're not i don't want to use the word struggling or but you know, that place where you feel like this is where i would like more guidance back to myself about this right what topics would be really really interesting to be writing about obviously one of them will be sexuality will be teenagers will be cognitive development um how our psyches develop in um how important it is to let kids be jerks <laughs> you know let them go through those periods of getting the feedback that like when i act like this this is the feedback i get i don't like that so i'm going to change my behavior just based on the feedback and not on somebody telling me it's wrong or bad I am, I don't know if this is going to affect my lives every Wednesday, but I am taking from my side energetically a month off, um, working with my private clients, but not really doing much of anything else and allowing this book to just really flesh itself out, the creating chapters and all of that stuff like just allowing it to come but there's not going to be a single push or anything like that it's there's a lot of um i don't even have words for what's happening actually but i'm super excited uh, excited would be it's a weird word i am i am surrendered to this work to this conversation that we're in right now and i think it's really important that the narrative change in whatever way that i can affect that i will And I, you know, there's, there's all this fear that I had for years. This, this has at least been seven years. And there were a lot of synchronicities that happened. First, a lot of people kept saying, Shanti, you need to write a book about parenting. And I kept pushing parenting away. I love emotional alchemy, but I didn't want to. And then I was teaching emotional alchemy. And my clients were like, you need to do, you need to do this in parenting. Like, I need help in that area. And I'm like, no, no, no. Um, and one of the reasons that I didn't was I have to be able to, tell the whole story of my own childhood and my own experience, meaning how I grew up, what happened to me, my conditioning, my parents, my sister, my siblings. Um, and I needed to be able to talk about my mothering, myself, my personal experience, and I need to be able to talk about my kids. That's the whole story. Plus, you know, ancestrals that in both directions towards my grandchildren. And, and be, I had to be able to be honest and not hide anything. And in the last four months I've gotten without asking total permission from everybody in my life to share openly and freely and my whole family right to share to not stop talking about it um, and then about 10 days ago my husband said I'm gonna teach these modules with you and I was like what like you guys my husband's not on Facebook and he really is not in love with the online world i mean his business is online but not like this like he has a website for his business um and i was like and that was like and my then it was my son who said mom you need to teach you need to tell people about this people need to know that there's a different way and um and he's 17 i was just like so and then when the decision dropped in there's nothing but yes i'm a yes to this and however that's going to unfold uh you all are here at the beginning the ability to choose your own emotions and Okay, this is where you're trying to apply adult. I, I'm just gonna do it really quick here, but I, my, I used to, okay, because I have an experience with Noah and Ayla talking about that, this exact subject. Here's the thing, this is cognitive. You get to choose your emotions. You get to choose your reaction. Makes sense when you're not in, in emotional development. After the emotional development, you start to be able to look, there's a there's a con cognition that is born. So at about seven or eight, there's a cognition that comes online. It's what I call the collective voice. It's a voice that uh, keeps you safe. The collective online 
piece that comes online at about between 16 and 18, 16 and 20, it really fuck, it depends on the person, um, then can look back and be like, oh, I can choose how I feel. For a child in emotional development, through, so from the ages of 8 to 15, to talk to them about choosing their emotions is almost meaningless. Right? That's why he's like, uh-uh. For me right now, it really fucking feels like my emotions I have no control over. Right? And here's the truth. We don't have control over choosing our emotions, but we do have control over how we react. That's a totally different conversation. I do not control when I feel angry. I do not control when I feel sad. I do not control when I don't like myself. But I can control how I react to the experience. Right? I can... I can have an effect on how I choose to react to how I feel. And then from that point, I can affect how I feel. But the original emotion of sadness or the original emotion of not enough or the original emotion of overwhelm, I had no control over that. That just shows up. No control whatsoever. It comes out of the ethers. It's coming through the conduit of my body. This is emotional alchemy. Emotions come and they go and they come and they go. What I do have the ability to do is go, oh, there's emotion. It's coming and it's going. I have this cognitive understanding. When you're 12, you don't. You don't. And to try to add in that kind of cognitive understanding is a misunderstanding at that age. And they will they will put their elbows up because it's not their lived experience. Super, this, is, this, this will help you a lot to like give him some space and be like, okay, I understand that your emotions aren't really in a place right now. I get it. This is, you know, your whole, like, his whole world is turned upside down and backwards. His body did, like, he went from being this kid who was free, and then all of a sudden there's this body, this huge body that's like, whoa, and it's doing all kinds of things. Like, it's confusing, and it's awkward, and it's messy. And he does the last thing he was here for me. He's like, you know you control how you feel. You need to know you understand him. You see him. You accept him for where he is. You're not trying to teach him. That's where a lot of like this new age, you control everything can be, can backfire and really alienate our loved ones instead of bringing them closer. And I have enough experience that of myself. That's why I'm telling you this is like, you need to put that in the closet for a little while. And if you do talk about it, you talk about it from your own experience. Hey, this is what I experience. Like when I have this reaction, this is what happens for me. And when I have that reaction, this happens to me. What do you think? What happened? Do you have that? Like, do you ever experience that? Like make it a conversation instead of a, you know, you need to understand this thing because he's just going to be like, nope, don't want to. You think you did. Watching me realize for a second when parent child relation, I feel my hurt from how I was raised. Good. I'm glad you brought this up because I had this with a client today too. Things I didn't even realize could be that I couldn't understand for myself and I feel so betrayed. I went through so much pain. I feel so angry. I don't know what to do with it. Good. Thank you for bringing this up because this is, this is important. This is super important. It's okay to feel sad. Um, I went through that. I went, I've gone through many phases of feeling really fucking sad for shit that happened to me as a kid. And you need to feel that sadness. And it's okay to feel angry about it. You need to feel that anger. Like, this is really important alchemy that's happening. What isn't wise or efficient is to get stuck there. Like, you have to move through this. You have to. It's important. It's important that you feel it first. It's important that you move through it second. Um, to hold your parents on the hook or to hold yourself on the hook, to hold, you, you basically freeze yourself in time in that experience. So you feeling sad about it is okay. Like you need to feel that sadness because you didn't, you couldn't feel it when you were a kid. There was no space for it with what you were going through. You didn't have time or space or the ground or the foundation or the boundaries or the caring to feel it. And now when I speak about it, you, ha you can, because you have now become the parent your life needed, right? You now can hold the foundation. You now can say, I got you, girl. Like, I got you, girl. It's okay. You can feel this now. You're safe with me. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel, um, like, what the fuck, man? Right? That kind of feeling like, dang, um, it couldn't have been different really important to know. Your parents could not have done different. It happened exactly as it happened. And that, we can't take that away. That's not going to change it. 
feeling bad about it is also not going to change it. It's not going to heal it. It's not going to make it right. But we do need to feel those feelings. We need to be really upset. We need to feel our sad. We need to feel our angry. And we need to move through that and be like, okay, that's what happened. And it's true. And I can't take it back. And I can't change it. And now, where do I focus? What do I do? Who do I want to be? Who can I be for myself right now? That isn't part of my past narrative. I'm going to bring my past narrative with me. Shanti is me. Like, that should happen to me. But who I am right now with you guys isn't that. It's who I am today. And of course, we go down the whole story of, like, I wouldn't be who I am. I would not be able to do this work had I not had the experience that I had in my childhood. I wouldn't have the level of understanding. Like, I have a, not only do I have, like, a book, scientific, blah, 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 understanding, but, like, an understanding because I live it, right? So for me, I've come to that place of, like, I have nothing but gratitude for my childhood because it shows me that we can do the work. So don't feel bad about feeling bad. Be angry. It's okay if you need to feel that anger, you need to feel that sadness because you had no space to do that when you were little. And now you are the big body that can hold your little body to feel through that, to be angry, to be upset, to be sad, to uh, feel the, the grief. That's really what it is. Grief has all of it, right? Grief kind of encompasses the whole experience of like, oh my God, fuck, what shit is this? And that just know that you are so loved and you are so lovable and your childhood does not depend, define that about you. And that our parents were doing the very best that they could. My par I have so much more awareness than my parents had. I can't now use the awareness that I have and now go beat the shit out of my parents for it. And my parents today are not who they were when I was a kid. They've grown too. They're not the same people. Like it's not fair to like put them in a box and be like these are the these are who they are, right? Um, and I mean I I had to go and regrow and reparent myself. I even went through like a I, I went through my sixteen year old writing my mom the nastiest letter. She came out her story. She came out. Like, oh. That was not my point, but I went through all of those phases. <laughs> I deal with every day is fighting and teasing between siblings. Yes, normal. Let's just, I don't start, it's normal. I was like interested in how to deal with conflict between siblings. Cool. So just real quick, because you know, I can't just like leave that there. Um, when they do something that hurts me, because I don't like it, I just say, I don't like it, it hurts me. I don't tell them not to do it to each other. Unless it's really disrespectful, like in my own, um, like for me, if it's, if it's in, with intent to hurt, then uh, we have to all sit down and talk because mama's gonna fuck her ass up, <laughs> right? But like, don't take their fighting with each other personally and that will change your whole life. Your whole life. Like, okay, that's just what siblings do. And um, setting your boundary of like whatever your level of disrespect or discomfort is saying, that's okay, like you're gonna fight, that's what it is, but this is not, like if it's with intent to hurt. That's my boundary. You have to find yours, which the boundary you'll know when you, when you when you relax in your body, when you know what it is, it's like, oh, like, I don't want them calling each other names. I don't want them um, just being nasty. I don't like them being nasty. Like, they're going to fight. They're going to struggle. They're going to have their things. Um, oh, this is a good one. I'm glad it came up. There was a time that uh, Noah and Ava were kind of ganging up on Rowan. And Rowan was having, a, like, a crisis of nobody loves me. And that was a time to sit down and have a big, long talk and boundaries and clarity and congruency. Casper and I had to come into congruency, total congruency, to have Rowan's back as much as we had their back. That was not happening. So we had to create a, a congruency. Um, and explanation about, like, like Rowan would, Rowan would say, this hurts me, this hurts And they would be like, yeah, whatever. I'm like, no, you need to sit down and you need to listen your behavior. This is how she feels. You need to listen. And so I, you can, there's ways that you can do it. It's, it's about, if you're taking their fighting personally, you will never know what your boundary is. Right. And so there's many, many ways. Just I'm just being my daughter because I can't talk. Um, and then the other one was, cause I don't feel like it's being my daughter. Like, okay, good. This is your trigger. This is yours. Your kids are being normal fighting little turds. This that you just brought up, this trigger 
you're putting that on top of what they're doing, which makes it scary for you, which makes it disgusting, which makes it, and the thing is, if you keep put layering that over their behavior, you're going to create the environment, and not necessarily it's going to happen, but you create the environment where he will belittle her. Right? Because that's how you'll be communicating. You'll be communicating through that trigger. So if you can go, okay, let me step back and be like, kids are normal. This is what, what I don't like, and this is what I don't want to see. And then you really get clear about that with the kids. Like, hey, when you, like, um, I can't remember, like, if they were to say you're fat or you're ugly or whatever, that would be so, that would be a line for me. That would be my boundary. would be like, mm, nope. That's not okay for me because that's that's meant with intent to harm and hurt and bring pain to the other person and I'm not into that. That's not that's not the relationship in my I don't want to live with that. So that's about me setting that boundary. This trigger is for you to work your way through because Melina, I cannot believe for one second that your children are living out that because they have you as a mom. They're not living that societal thing out. They have you as a mom, and that makes all the difference in the whole world. I promise you. Right? He's not evil. He's not a little dictator. He's not a masochist. He's not. He's not a little misogynist. Like if you can, like, kind of like brush that out of your head and just see him for being a little turd, a little boy who's doing a very normal behavior who needs some boundaries from you, clear boundaries. That's it. One, two little tweaks in your behavior, and it will clear up probably. And then if that doesn't work, you can tweak something a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more until you feel calm with it. Right? When you get afraid that this is what's happening, you you recreate that experience for yourself. So it's like, okay, let me separate the two. Let me see this with two eyes. One eye is clear and sees that these are just kids being kids. And the other eye is, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think it's this pattern, but it's really just kids being kids. This is where we plaster adult cognition adult understanding of the world on our children and they don't have that. They're not doing that. They're not capable. Like you couldn't sit down and be like, this is what's happening. You're belittling women in society. He wouldn't understand that. Right? For right now, that's just his sister. He, there's not a woman. There's not a woman here. There's him and his sister. He does not decipher between she's a girl and I'm better than her or any of that. Um, at least I would ask him about it, but I don't think that he does. And boys, boys need to be aggressive. They need to have a place for aggression. And, uh, and how old is he? I can't remember, Melina. Is he 10 now? So he, uh, he's going to need to start having a place where he, where he can be aggressive and kind of boy. You know, he's going to start needing a male outlet. For that he will need that or he will turn it against his sister but it's not because he's bad or it's a boy girl thing it's just because he needs an outlet to express that stuff that isn't towards a girl but boys don't at this point it's not about that like Noah had to learn yeah Noah had to, yeah so at 10 he's going to start to need to have room for elbowy aggressive wrestling kind of stuff or he's gonna start spewing nasty stuff <laughs> that's really what it is and um, in our family, Casper took on that role. But if that's if that's not the case, like you don't either there's not a father figure or dad's not able to take on that role, it would be like some kind of aggressive sport or some way that he's he's being able to uh, experience uh, jujitsu is really good, really really good, really good for that jujitsu. Like in that age, it starts that their they they get their first hormone juke and there's an aggression in their body that they don't have any idea how to handle. And um, if they don't have a physical outlet, they just start to be snarly because they're trying to, boys at that age, they start to try to like, they're playing with dominance, right? Not understanding at all that they will eventually be bigger and stronger than the girls. They don't get that. That was like where Noah had to come into that space of like, oh, I'm getting stronger. I think I feel like, because I think it's a problem. Yes, exactly. It's normal. We need to come back into that place where kids just do shit, normal shit. And we plaster adult understanding, adult um, conditioning, adult narrative 
we put adult narrative on kids all the time. And it's just like about coming back and being like, oh, they're just kids. And I can, if I'm clear with my boundaries, then I'm chill, right? And when I can see like, oh, he needs an outlet, you know, and this is something that's not talked about that really Casper's so good about talking about is boys need an outlet. They need an outlet with a man, like a, a clear, this is where I get to like get my aggressions out. This is where I get to be manly. This is where I get to push my dominance because eventually they're going to have to stand up and be men. And be dominant and provide and do the things that make them excited about life. And if that's crushed out of them, well, we all know what that looks like, right? So it's just about giving him a different outlet other than his sister <laughs> to be nasty towards. He's, he, every kid needs to go through that phase, and especially boys at this age, to be nasty. They just, they do. Ayla's nasty in another, she's more like, <laughs> like she gets you, you know, with some nasty little thing she says or whatever. Hi, Marlies. Um, but every kid needs to have the room to be nasty and to try that out and to feel what that's about. Like, my kids being nasty toward me, I let them know that's really painful. That hurts me when you talk to me like that. I don't like it. Right? So. <sighs> Thank you guys for being here. And I will talk about all of this again and again and again and again. And I won't stop. I won't stop. I love you guys.